Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you're very welcome this evening to um, a lively, what we hope is a very lively and interesting discussion, uh, which will start with uh, Stephen McKenna and Richard DeMarco, and I hope we'll have uh, a complete um, involvement by the, the audience that's here this evening. Thank you very much for coming, because I know with the best will in the world, very often people say, I'm definitely coming, and then something um, else um, turns up. But it's a great... Um, Turn out this evening, and I'm just very pleased to welcome Richard DeMarco, who has come over from Edinburgh, and also Stephen McKenna, who has come all the way from Bagnestar. Um, just as a just as a little a, a, a short introduction uh, to both people, um, Richard DeMarco was uh, born in Edinburgh and is an artist and promoter of the visual arts. He has long been one of Scotland's most influential advocates of contemporary art through his work at the Richard DeMarco Gallery and then the DeMarco European Art Foundation, as well as his professorship at Kingston University in London. The DeMarco Gallery and Foundation has consistently promoted cross-cultural links, both in terms of presenting artists such as Joseph Boyce, Cantor and Marina Abramovich in Scotland and also in establishing outgoing connections for Scottish artists across Europe. Richard DeMarco first presented Boyce at the Edinburgh Festival exhibition Strategy Gets Arts in 1970 and worked with them frequently until 1986. He introduced Boyce and Cantor to one another and in one performance of Lovelies and Dowdies, Boyce performed under Cantor's direction. Richard's Edinburgh arts journeys crisscross all of Europe, taking artists and academics from other countries alongside those of Scotland to visit interesting people, great collections, cities, landscapes and events, examining European culture for the last millennia, 5,000 years. It is his, for his consistent internationalism that he has been successfully, was successfully nominated as European Citizen of the Year in 2013. This also followed from his exhibition, Scotland in Europe, Europe in Scotland in Brussels in 2011, and his own artworks were included in the Italian pavilion of the 2011 Venice Biennale. In 2013, Richard organised an Italo-Scottish pavilion at the Venice Biennale, his fourth pavilion there. He has extensive connections to Ireland and its artists, his friendship with Stephen McKenna, not, not the least, He's also exhibited artists including Anne Madden in 1971 and Louis Le Brocchi in 1977. And throughout the 70s, the experimental Edinburgh Art Summer Schools visited Ireland as part of their explorations of the shared cultural heritage of Europe. He has a particular connection with the Hugh Lane as a 1975 exhibition of 49 Yugoslavian artists called Aspect 75, which I'm not sure I was, sorry, was presented here after Edinburgh. In 1984, he organised Contemporary Art in the Human Environment, Dublin, a case study, an international conference at the National Gallery of Ireland. And then he also, in 1997, curated Column Kill at the Glebe Gallery, Churchill, and the Art Centre Letterkenny, which featured works by six Irish and six Scottish artists, including Stephen McKenna. The exhibition Boyce Cantor de Marco opens in October at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Krakow and he's currently working on a 2016 exhibition Genstam Kunstwerk, I know I haven't said that right, at the Centre Pompidou in Paris. And in, in 2006, Richard de Marco was awarded a CBE. Welcome, Richard. I feel I'm on mastermind. <laughs> 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 so, uh, for, um, Stephen McKenna is known to most of you here, but I do think in this context you will allow me just to, to uh, read something on Stephen. Uh, Stephen has been a painter all of his life, and this exhibition, Perspectives of Europe, reveals his enduring interest in the man-made infrastructures of European cities and the culture and civilizations that have shaped their identities, including their treasured culture artifacts and how they interface with the natural environment particularly the ports on which they are built. Deeply informed by European classicism, Stephen McKenna's works have a unique modernity and particular way of seeing uh, places and objects, many of which have been around for millennia. His paintings embed a new layer of contemporary painterly expression into the established can canon. Born in London just before the war, he remembers a city in ruins, and then in 1946 the family moved to Vienna, which was another scene of devastation, and it was, he said, like the film The Third Man. 
divided uh, between three governments and a city in rubble. Returning to London for 10 years, he then began his travels to the cities of Europe, moving to Germany in 1971. His extensive visits to picture galleries of Europe helped him, feel his, helped him feel his way into the art of painting, embedding his experience into, into what is now, of course, an instinctual practice. Perspectives of Europe reveals his interests in cities, architecture and landscape, and, a and an appreciation for the particular, the local, which has informed the identity of the European city, be it Dublin, Porto, Naples, Madeira, Derry, Berlin, Las Palmas cities that was, which have interacted with each other across the European landscape. McKenna appreciates how art has no boundary, and while it springs from the local, its influences are widespread. And just, you know, from Ireland, we, we sent you know, our culture and civilization to Europe through our saints um, in the 7th and 8th centuries. And it's very interesting to note that how our, um, Dublin, particularly as a city, has changed, you know, hugely in the last 20 years and as we embrace you know uh, these diverse communities we also are now um, looking as to how to embrace the cultures which add to the great wealth of cultural expressions that's in the city and this year we are also bidding to become European Capital Culture 2020 and the bid book has as part as a central to its theme is social change through culture not just through the arts, but social change through culture. So the cities that Stephen has painted, be it recognisable, they have a unique vision which is informed by his experiences, his spirit and his memories. And his uh, pursuit of painting has freed up this classical tradition, creating a virtuosity of contemporary expression. Uh, exhibiting in, um, extensively in Europe in 1997 on the invitation of the de then director of the Irish Museum of Modern Art, Declan McGonagall, Stephen curated a group exhibition in pursuit of painting, which saw the inclusion of both representative and abstraction, Bonnard, Gwen John, Sean Scully and many others, because it was really the body of the work, the loaded of the paint, the weight of the paint and the body and the way it related to the content that was of paramount importance to Stephen. Nominated for the, so he says, it's his, uh, nominated for the Turner Prize in 1986 and president of the Royal Hibernian Academy from 2005 to 2009, over the past five decades, Stephen McKenna has produced a fabulous, curious and celebrated oeuvre that has significantly added to the canon of European painting. So thank you very much, Stephen and Richard, for coming this evening. And so um, we start our talk. Would you like to, um, to first of all talk to Stephen as to the title of the, the exhibition and uh, the, the main sort of you know thrust and focus of it? Well, the, like most exhibitions, the title comes after the work has been done. One one doesn't work to a program. And when you come to do an exhibition, you consider the spaces in the gallery, obviously, and then also, what is it going to be a thematic exhibition, a time-based exhibition, or a mixture of the two? And in this particular case, um, the exhibition was done in two places, here and in Middlesbrough. There's a substantial publication, and I decided I wanted both exhibitions and the book to cover certain of my experiences about Europe, living in Europe, traveling in Europe, looking at European culture. And so that became the theme. This meant I left out um, a lot of other aspects of my work, one always does. Um, and what we decided for this particular exhibition here in the Hugh Lane, that was together with Barbara, we looked at the work in my studio, and decided we would concentrate on architecture and trees. And that's what we've done. That's where the actual selection of paintings comes from. Richard, you've just arrived and you've seen the exhibition. Um, would you like to say what your thoughts are? Well, um, it's substantially different from the experience of the exhibition I, I had in Middlesbrough. And uh, it's very interesting, of course, um, part of the history of the family of, uh, of uh, Stephen is associated with Middlesbrough. 
strange enough. And it was magnificently dis, uh, exhibited there uh, in what it must be one of the best examples of a gallery of, uh, galleries of modern art anywhere in Europe. And it's part of the regeneration through the arts of the city. Well, I made a very special effort to be there because I have long uh, regarded Stephen and his life's work as important to um, our understanding of what is art in the, well, the 20th century. I guess that's over now. And this extension of it, which uh, seems to be making the same mistakes as the 20th century, the 21st century. Now we've reached a point where there's a great deal of confusion in who we are in terms of the culture we represent. I think there's no doubt that the title of this exhibition is vitally important to us. It's Perspectives of Europe. So it means that uh, using the skill of the painter, he has uh, focused completely on the reality of Europe, um, the totality of Europe. I must tell you right now that I have no um, real um, credentials to represent Scotland, not with a name on my birth certificate of Ricardo Di Marco. Can you imagine that? No clan, no tartan. Uh, uh, um, in, in many ways, um, wondering what on earth the Italians were doing, leaving uh, that beautiful part of Italy between Rome and Naples to make the long journey towards that point where long before they made that journey, the Roman legions, legionaries made the journey because it was once the extreme uh, northwestern uh, boundary, frontier of the Roman Empire. So at one point, I guess, uh, these Italian immigrants to Scotland were going back to an aspect of Europe, which was united by something called the Roman Empire. This has intrigued me greatly uh, because um, I am not so much Italian as Roman, with a name like DeMarco, follower of Marcus, whoever that was. Um, and I'm thinking that uh, maybe I'm not completely Italian, because who could be Italian with a great grandmother called Elizabeth McGuinness, a Dubliner? Uh, and she won the heart of a survivor of the Risorgimento, who found himself on his way to America, obviously, um, uh, dealing with her uh, at uh, the end of the 19th century. Uh, that was my great-grandfather. And they produced um, a situation which involved my mother being born, uh, not in Dublin, but in Bangor, County Down. So, you, you understand, I feel completely at home in both uh, whatever you like to call the North of Ireland and uh, the Republic of Ireland. I've always felt at home here, even during the Troubles, when I was fortunate enough to know a great friend of mine called Ted Hickey. And Ted was one of the great forces of nature. I, he was a great singer of... Um, the, the kind of ballads that could only come out of the Celtic imagination. But what I'd like you to know is I began to understand Ireland through my friendship with him and also through my friendship um, before I met him in the 60s with people like Dorothy Walker and um, someone called uh, uh, Michael Scott and all, his, all their friends. So I've been associated with Ireland knowing that if you consider the Latin name for Scotland, uh, which is uh, Scotus, 
Um, you have to work out what on earth were we talking about when we regarded the life of a very famous European who was buried, I think, in Cologne Cathedral, a great thinker. He was called Duns Scotus, and it meant the Irishman from Duns. It, it's this kind of thinking. It's about friendships, and it's about the fact that uh, I've, I've never been able to consider Ireland and Scotland as being uh, separate, ge ge geographically, geologically, or culturally. And so when I find that there's an artist uh, called Stephen McKenna, whose whole purpose and function is to celebrate uh, a wider, truer concept of the world I think I live in, which is Europe, I have no doubt that I have to take him very seriously indeed. Richard sort of based himself in Edinburgh and brought the artists to Edinburgh and sent the uh, Edinburgh artists out. You were an itinerant through Europe for a long time, wandering around. How important do you think this cultural interface be, between people is in, in the sense of both for the arts and indeed both for identity? It's a complex question, that. and th th There is no simple answer. Uh, because... <laughs> You have to, there are two levels. There's the human one, the people one meets, uh, the colleagues, the friends, or the enemies working in different places. And then there are the places themselves, which don't always coincide. You get odd situations, like um, at, the, at the late end of the 19th century, early 20th century, anyone who was an artist in Ireland, uh, went to France. Before that, they went to London. Uh, during the 80s, they went to Berlin. So in Berlin, you could meet a whole section of Irish artists. Uh, and things move like that. In the 70s, I suppose, people went to New York. And there, there, are, there are different places throughout the world which pretend to be the center of art. Sometimes there's a reality in this. Hmm? There's no doubt that at certain stages, most of the best painters in the world were working in Paris. There's little doubt about it. Whether they were French or not is another matter. Some of them were French, some of them weren't. Um, whether that was true of New York is still debatable, perhaps. I don't think it's ever been true of London or Dublin. Or, but both, most painting in Ireland over the centuries came from England. Most painting in England came from Holland. It was as simple as that. Hmm? Um, and there have always been a few figures. Uh, the English produced the great George Stubbs and Hogarth, um, who were English painters, uh, very much so. Uh, the Irish produced Jack Yates. I think perhaps the only one who's really an Irish painter, huh? Jack Yates. It's, um, and then there are people who work here, there are people who use the subject matter, for, for me, Europe was just somewhere I grew up in wandering, more or less. Both I started as a child and I continued as an adult. And I, I feel at home in Bonn, Berlin, Brussels, Rome, um, London, Dublin. I don't think it matters much. Um, and one interacts with the people one meets. I've, for a long time, I've, uh, uh, Richard mentioned earlier local culture. I think it's of huge importance. What's absolutely irrelevant is national culture. Yeah. I don't think of any such thing. Yeah, yeah. Nationalism is, is a silly invention. Hmm? But local patriotism, local culture, the way one set of people speak in the Iberian Peninsula, this is hugely important. And it's not just Catalans and Basques, there's Andalusians, there's Galicians. Hmm? Um, and there's the Magdalenos. I mean, the, Spain is made up of dozens of different cultures, as is Germany. Talk to a Bavarian. Hmm? <laughs> yeah. uh, this, the rest of the world is the pricing, hmm? <laughs> including foreigners, including us. We're just yes. foreigners. Yeah. Talk to somebody from the Rhineland, 
This is the old Burgundian Empire, the Empire of the Middle. They drink wine. They eat like the French. The Prussians are just invaders, and the barbarians are savages. The, the, uh, the, 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 the North Germans are English, more or less. They, you, if you travel around Europe, you get to know that there's no such thing as the nation state. Of course, there are some older than others. Yeah. There's the United, not the United Kingdom, sorry. There's England, which is, goes back a long way. There's um, uh, France, which is relatively, I mean, it's 18th, 17th century when it first unified. Italy was unified in the 1860s. Uh, Germany, even, in the 1870s, you could say. It's, and then there are the other countries like Russia, for me, part of Europe, which the Ukraine is part of Russia. It always was. And I mean, all these things have their political points which come up now and then, but they also have their cultural backgrounds. The more one lives in these places, the more one looks, the more one reads, the more one talks to the people, the more one becomes aware, or I become aware, of the interdependence of all this. And that, that's what's important. And in the end, one, one hopes, one digests culture. I don't think there's a program for learning about European yeah. culture. Well, one can encourage people to travel, and to go and look at things, and, and people. But in the end, it's a natural process of nourishment and digestion. That's all I can say. And as I say, this is, I've, it's the title of an exhibition. In that sense, it's thematic. But it's actually the nature of my work. All of it, I think. Even if I paint a still life, I'm aware of European painting. All of it. <laughs> I mean, it, there's something about the, the landmass that makes up Europe and how fascinating, how, how much the, the um, you know, differences in culture and, as you say, it's almost regional as opposed to, mm -hmm. to national, which makes it a very, very interesting place to, um, uh, to con go constantly visit again, and, you know, all the, as, over the years. Um, where is culture's place at the moment, in the, certainly in the European identity? I've lived... I've been lucky enough to live a long life, and I've now reached the point when most of my dearest friends are apparently uh, dead. Of course, in the case of somebody like Joseph Boyce or Cantor or, or whatever, they're hardly dead, because great artists don't die. They have the habit of uh, being with you uh, when you're thinking most profound thoughts. You need them. but. Um, that was a very important question you've asked, because in my long life, I have had the, if you like, the advantage of knowing that the world was a very different place in 1947, when the Edinburgh Festival was born. I don't know why the Edinburgh Festival, I don't know why that great festival was thrust upon Edinburgh, because it was. Obviously, Edinburgh didn't want it. Can you imagine the council saying, what? We, we, we're, we're suffering from uh, um, rationing of food, of clothes. Uh, we, we can't operate. We don't have enough electricity. I mean, what are you talking about, culture? It's ridiculous. But the people who really wanted the festival knew that the one great language that the human race has which can effectively heal the wounds of something agonizing like the, the, war, the war, the Second World War, was the language of all the arts. And thankfully, the first director of, of uh, um, the festival, the man who really founded it, was German speaking. He was a Ber Berliner, <laughs> Austrian, but a Berliner, Rudolf Bing. And the first festival was a celebration of German culture. By God, 1947, when the word Germany was a dirty word, and we'd learned to hate everything about Germany. But this hit me so hard. I was still at school. I was only 17 or something. And I suddenly realized that had I personally had been given a great gift. And um, I would never have stayed in Edinburgh, by the way, if it hadn't been for the festival. There are two, two experiences for anyone living in Edinburgh from 1947 onwards, even to now. 
It, there's the Edinburgh of the Edinburgh Festival when it becomes the world capital of culture. I mean, you really mean that. The whole world comes there. Still, it's, it's not the case with Dublin. It's sad. And that's why I had that contemporary thing where I said, you have to consider Dublin as important. I know you don't have a castle. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why Edinburgh got its festival. But nevertheless, you have an awful lot going for you, and you should have something which provides a stage for the whole world, a neutral space where the language of art can be taken seriously. But I think I have to say that whether we like it or not, the words of Marshall McLuhan have come very true. We are living in a global village more than ever. And we're also living uh, in a world where the political systems seem to be completely out of control, uh, awry. Uh, it's not just the problem of the refugees. It's not just a question of the economy uh, and the whole nonsense of Europe being united through something stupid like the euro, when it should be united through the language of culture. I mean, Jean Monnet said, as it two or three years after he'd helped to found the, the economic union, he said, what a nonsense that I thought I could unite Europe, Europe through the idea of the uh, coal and steel, which should have been culture. He said that. I, I, I could give you the text where he actually wrote that down. And I know that the Edinburgh Festival has been a magnet for anyone who really takes culture and the language of the art seriously, um, uh, well, ever since 1947. And in the 60s, something happened which did unite, I thought, uh, Dublin and Edinburgh. It was something called ROSC. God, I can't believe it. There are people here who can remember that. I'm not alone. It was a miracle. Of course, there was no place to show the great works, mm -hmm. so they had to use that place where the horses were displayed uh, as... The audience. The audience. <laughs> yes. Um, and I remember thinking, uh, a miracle has taken place. And the reason I was there was uh, because I'd become a great friend of a great artist called Cecil King. And Cecil had had an exhibition with me in my gallery, which was resolutely international. I, I have nightmares of the idea that I might be condemned to being uh, somehow a part of the Scottish art world. I'm not. I mean, who on earth would want to be defined as a Scottish artist, or an Irish artist, for that matter? <laughs> and one of the reasons why I think this man is important to Ireland is that in every sense, he makes manifest uh, a Europe that we have to take seriously. Uh, you, you cannot ignore his life's work. And in his life and in his art, you have, you have a very thin line separating them. They're one and the same thing. I love the fact that he can speak uh, German and Italian and other languages. I love the fact that he's at home in all over the place, including Donegal, which is so important to me, uh, because really what he's about, what he stands for, is uh, in many ways that vital periphery of Europe, which attracted Joseph Boyce in the first place to come to somewhere called Scotland. Um, I remember thinking, one shouldn't be all the time going on about the importance of a center of culture. Uh, because without the concept of the periphery, the center really loses real significance or uh, energy. You need the periphery. And one of the most important aspects of the periphery of the continent of Europe is that part of it. N not the Euros, wh where you have Eurasia, wh which Boyce focused on because of the war, but that periphery, which is all about where Europe ends and something called Finisterre, the end of the world, becomes a reality. And the great power of the Atlantic uh, hammers our shorelines. 
And it's in that world that there's a special kind of light. I know that we've got people here, thank God, students from Argentina, from Mexico, from um, Korea. Fantastic, so good to see you. Um, but I can tell you right now, there's a, a space that would inspire any artist. And it's the, the space of the periphery defined by the culture of Europe, which is Celtic. It's not enough to be a Roman. <laughs> I know that. By my very, the blood that courses through my veins. Thank God for my great, gra uh, great grandmother. And thank God that they fell in love, these two people, one woman and one uh, a Celt. I know that since then, since the world of Garibaldi, uh, getting rid of frontiers and, and the, the, the process of unifying countries, we are, are more than ever mm, in need of the power of art to be the unifying force which brings us together. It's the one language I know that uh, I suppose could be defined as the language of loving and caring and exalting the whole business of being alive. And there's no other language. There's absolutely no other language which is so important. I can't understand why every government is so reluctant to provide the money which keeps us sane. Because without art, we go, bank, we go bonkers. We become mad. And I'm thinking not just of the music, of the great poetry, the great literature, uh, the, the great aspects of the performing arts. I'm thinking of that lonely and almost impossible work of the painter. And one of the reasons I cannot forget one of the great exhibitions that took place uh, not in Italy, nowhere in the uh, United Kingdom, it took place here. It's this one. This blew my mind away. And it was an exhibition called The Pursuit of Painting, which was an extraordinary title. The Pursuit of Painting. As if, if you're not careful, it will vanish. You, you, you have to somehow hold on to it. And the cover and the back cover was all about the working, the process of working as a painter. They were not, well, they're not paintings, but they are about the stuff and substance of the life of the painter. Now, I happen to be speaking to you as a watercolorist. <laughs> uh, so I, I know the importance of making a mark upon a, well, a surface, a piece of paper, uh, making a mark with a pencil or a brush or whatever. I think it's, it's a sacred and extraordinary thing that's been with us from the beginning of time, from the time when there were people in caves. It's the most natural thing in the world, and every single human being is born to use it to express themselves. And I'm thinking of every child at a primary school and the horror of what happens when they go to a secondary school when they're 100% naturally using their uh, ability to make marks. Uh, and they draw without even thinking. They the, the paint. The, the, you, you watch children and you, you find that. Now, I am determined to um, prove the point that art is the most important thing we have in terms of dealing with the visual reality of the form of a city, for example. When I see architecture that's really destructive to the architectural heritage of any city, I realized that one of the problems is visual illiteracy. Well, to stop that nonsense, because you know you're dealing with a politician, usually someone obviously visually illiterate, 
so there's no point talking about <laughs> the ugliness of a building or, or, or an environment. No, no, no point talking about how London has been destroyed in my lifetime with some of the ugliest buildings in the name of what you call architecture. Um, I'm seeing, hands up anyone who's got this catalogue. There's, oh, thank God, one, <laughs> two, three, four, because they're, they're, they're like gold dust. Maybe uh, we could get, maybe we could, sorry, uh, when you're ready, maybe we could get Stephen just to talk a little bit about that. That's exhibition. what I'm wanting. Yeah. Mm. Uh, 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 because uh, it's got people like Philem Egan that I showed, and it's got other artists uh, that have very much um, helped me hold on to the whole idea that paintings are born. Paolo Wego, uh, Leonard McComb, Balthus. I think you could tell us something about the importance of this. And by the way, the man who allowed it to happen wasn't too happy about it. <laughs> but being an artist and heavily disguised as, a, I suppose, a gallery director, uh, but was essentially a painter, knew that it was important for a painter to put this exhibition together. So these two people, fellow painters, were responsible for this exhibition. And speaking, of course, of, uh, of Declan in Nothing his role there. as director of IMA. So just, I think we, just, we in, must listen. Yes, just in advance of that, um, where you, if you look to your, my left, your right, into this room here, this is the beginning of the collection that was uh, brought together and opened in Dublin in 1908, or brought together by Hugh Lane. And the diversity of European culture is actually um, expressed in that room. If you look at the photographs of Hugh, uh, the photographs, the paintings and portrait of Hugh Lane by Mancini um, down at the end, the full length one, and of his sister uh, here. Mancini was from Naples and uh, Hugh Lane brought him to Dublin. Uh, to paint these portraits. Mancini, when he was painting uh, Mrs. Shine, uh, Hugh Lane's sister, just wanted people to bring in orange trees. Would they mind bringing in just a load of orange trees into the studio? And when he was told there wasn't an orange tree within, uh, you know, <laughs> a thousand miles of Dublin, uh, like they had to get bay trees and tie the oranges on it just to explain it to him. Um, and then also in this room you have uh, Baldini's portrait of Mrs. Um, Phillips, Mrs. Lionel Phillips, and she got Hugh Lane to um, found the Gallery of Modern Art in Johannesburg. We also have Charles Condor to the right of it, who was so um, sought after in his lifetime, actually Australian, and so expensive, and we've forgotten about mm -hmm. him now. But even if you go through this collection here, you can see that there's always been this periphery, which is Ireland, has, I think, always had this curiosity yes. and always looking out to Europe. But perhaps that's not the case, or people might think it's too inward looking. And I'd like people maybe to ask questions about that. But just before we do, perhaps you talk a little bit about the pursuit of painting. Well, I don't want to say too much about that exhibition, because once an exhibition's passed, you can't see it anymore. It, it's, it's a question of the consolation of the works in it. What I wanted to do with that, well, as always, there are several things one wants to do. I, I wanted to um, give a summation of painting, not, not art, painting, as I saw it then. That means those painters from the 20th century, it was limited to European painting of the 20th century, um, those painters of the 20th century who had influenced my work and an equivalent number of my contemporaries and colleagues who, with whom there had been a reciprocal interchange. They'd influenced me, I'd influenced them. Uh, and they in turn had been influenced by my heroes of the 20th century. And what I wanted to do was bring together the actual canvases. <laughs> It's interesting, one talks about paintings, pictures, canvases, as if they're interchangeable. They are in a sense, but the term a canvas is something really solid material. And I often prefer that word, this is canvas. It's not a picture. A picture could be a photograph. Hmm? A painting is a painting, and a canvas is something real. And in this particular exhibition, what I wanted to try and do was present the canvases of the last the time, 97 years or whatever. And uh, well, I hope it was successful. I must ask you one thing. 
uh, if you had to choose one painting out of that uh, exhibition, uh, which more or less set the pace for the whole idea of the 20th century and the seriousness of painting, uh, would, it have, would it be the Malevich? No, it wouldn't. Uh, it, I think it's one of the great paintings of the 20th century. I don't think that, that particular painting had very much influence. Uh, in fact, Malevich was regarded at the time when he painted that picture as somebody who'd lost his courage, who'd given in to, to Soviet uh, yeah, pressure. Uh, it's not true. I, I think Malevich had arrived at that conclusion through a very intelligent and self-critical process, but it wasn't seen that way. Malevich's figurative paintings were, were that's a self-portrait. It, it's on the level of Piero della Francesca, there's no doubt about it, hmm? uh, both as a painting and as a statement. In that sense, it's one of the great paintings of the 20th century. And the fact that we could show it here in Dublin was unbelievable. Yeah. Huh? But uh, I don't think it had much influence, in fact. Even today, it's regarded as an eccentricity. Hmm? But can you tell me a little bit about the impact of your reading, constant reading, of uh, Karl Popper? Yes. Uh, because he, his view of history mm -hmm. is very important. Yes. And it, it, it's uh, in harmony with your view. Well, mine is in harmony with his. Oh, oh, I learned from him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can you just uh, speak about that? Um, well, yes, I, 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 I was introduced to the writings of Karl Popper when I was a student. This was in, in the late 1950s. And I'd done my usual su superfluous or superfluous reading of philosophy from Plato to current, current uh, French structuralists. And somebody pointed out Karl Popper, which I then began to read. And he's not much read today. I'm sure some of you are familiar with Karl Popper's writings. But what he, what he did, he, his critique was of idealism, ideologues, and historicism. The idea that history had rules and yeah. would progress in a certain way. His big enemy was uh, Karl Marx. Hmm? Uh, um, and Hegel, who was the, one of the, 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 the main influences on, on Marxist thinking, because they thought they could forecast what was going to happen to political history. Yeah. And I was more concerned, Popper not so much, although he mentioned it, about the, let's say, the critical theories of the 20th century, starting in the late 19th century. Well, no, the, the theories started in the 20th century more. Um, went back to certain uh, German and, and, and Swiss historians, the idea that art progresses, yeah. that, that there are things which have to be done, that there are movements, that um, Impressionism would be um, succeeded by Cubism, that after Cubism would come Surrealism, after Surrealism would come Abstract Expressionism, and so on and so on and so on. And th that idea that there was a progression in anything is for me anathema. I don't think there's any progression. And there are certainly no rules. I like that. So is, is everything uh, circular? No. <laughs> <laughs> Can you explain that? Yes. It's uh, not circular. Uh, yes. If you disregard <laughs> the idea of time as being essential to every kind of thinking, the problem of progression doesn't exist. The past and the, and the present and the future are no longer divisible like that. All one ever knows in that sense is the present. And that, you, the, the present is spatial. You see it. You don't experience the present, you see it, if it's really the present. And that is the job of the painter, to see things, not to experience them, to see them. But you need, does the experience of it help your vision of it? Like, you, you know, you have an experience of, You have an experience of seeing. Yes, yes, yes. And this, this accumulates <laughs> over the years. It's yeah. not as simple as I'm making out. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's the experience mm. of the, the play. Would we like to, I'm sure there are some questions here. Would, would, we like to, uh, would somebody like to ask a question? I was wondering about um, how we see um, Ireland, uh, which is geographically peripheral, but how we see ourselves as European or the diversity of culture here, or indeed is there a regional expression 
in, in Ireland or in, let's say, England, Wales, Scotland, in the same way as there is in mainland continental Europe? Or well, it, one of the things that strikes me is we're in a space which defends, I suppose, the essential nature of European, the European cultural heritage. You have the Greco-Romano uh, cultural heritage in these columns, okay? Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, we could be somewhere, I suppose, in Italy or France here. Uh, it, it's a hymn of praise to the classical... Neo-Palladian. Ne Neo-Palladian, yeah, yes, it, to be precise. And I, I find this... Uh, one of the most beautiful spaces I've, I've ever known for art. And one of the great features of the exhibition upstairs is it's beautifully at one with, with the extraordinary spaces created by these rooms. Um, and, and I think you can't get away from the idea uh, that, that, that we're, we're inheriting something very precious. And it is something we should be proud of. The Americans are slowly but surely taking it on board, uh, but they're a very young and uncouth uh, uh, culture, and they have their problems at the moment. And I think the union of Europe, culturally, is at the heart of what we might think is the future for us all. Um, and I'm speaking, uh, knowing full well uh, that we don't have a system which could probably uh, fulfill my hopes uh, at the moment. But I'd love to hear some questions put to us. So, you, you, there's been you know, five decades of painting, but up to six decades of European experience is the yeah. same with you. I mean, we have, um, you mentioned the global village. We have a technological system that we couldn't have dreamt about 25 years oh. ago, you know, instant... Um, instant communication, instant. Now, is this um, a unif unifier or is this a divider? Does this help uh, cultural expression and, and embracing diversity of cultural expression? Or, or how, do you see, how do you see Europe now, as, let's say, after the Second World War? Or how do, where do you see the big differences? Or are, are there any, or is there? Well, I think that the, the technological innovations you were referring to makes things invisible, not visible. You cannot yeah. see them anymore because we are dealing, the biggest, biggest problem, I think, of today is what's called virtual reality. The yep. fact that we do not actually see or experience anything directly. It, it's filtered through a, system, a technological system, a reproductive system, reproductive in the sense that it, it is a reproduction, a copy, a version of it. Um, and then marketed as entertainment. <laughs> and yes. I mean both words. Yeah. Here we are at the work today where it attracts me. Most attention has been given to a movement which is trying to do the exact opposite. Yes. And I'm talking about the Zaha Hadidus in architecture, the data versus in painting. And, and that's a totally different system. From, from the history which informs every word and all your body language. I would just love to hear your views on that. Because especially as I mean you seriously tend to be the opposite to internationalize it and create an international language and create an elite within that in its various systems. Big question I would I'd love to hear your response to that. Hi. I think it's important to decide, to decide what we mean by an elite. Uh, at, at the moment, the, the art world, the art market, and to a large extent the architectural world and practice, I think, is conducted in terms of celebrities. Yes. Um, yeah. a, a celebrity is not an elite. Elite are the people who are good at things. Um, Des and I have something in common. We are both past presidents of the Royal Hibernian Academy. One of the members once said, we don't want to be seen as an elite. 
My quest reply was, we do. We are an elite. And that's what it's meant to be. But to be an elite means you have huge responsibilities. Yeah. And today, I think the, the confusion between an, an elite and a, there is a, an elitism of celebrities, or a, which is a huge mistake, uh, and is tied up inevitably with money, with with people making large sums of money. And I I don't even mean the artists or architects themselves, although they are very talented at it. It's, th there are other bodies making money out of this. Thank you, Stephen. That will turn the echoes. One of the lines I remember from Bruno, which was James Herbert's work on conservation, yes. to never avoid, to never confuse eccentricity with distinction. Exactly. Ah. Exactly. Very good. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm so pleased that we have two past presidents <laughs> of the Royal Hibernian uh, Academy here. Uh, I am an honorary member of the Royal Scottish Academy, and we met, didn't we? I, I met the present. So we've got three uh, distinguished <laughs> members of the elite. An academy is a very interesting thing. Just hold it up to your... Oh, yes. An academy it. is something which interests me. It comes from the Greek concept, doesn't it? Of, uh, well, those responsible for uh, defining society, uh, people who are have the time and the urge to, to really seriously consider what it means to be a member of a social structure. I, I know that the Edinburgh Festival is in dire trouble. And if any of you went to see the Venice Biennale this year, you'll know that the Venice Biennale is in dire trouble too. Both are bloated, too big, confusing, and very dangerously um, veering towards the world of entertainment. Because I think the world of entertainment is engulfing the world of culture. And I hear that the new rather dodgy building which is being attached to the Tate Modern is all about uh, inclusion. So that everybody can have a great time in uh, the, the galleries. For me, being in a gallery means I'm in a place where I need to contemplate, I need space around me to co contemplate the truth which is coming at me. And remember what a painting is. A painting doesn't speak, it doesn't move. You move, you, you speak to it. There's a conversation going on. And I can't believe the whole idea should be that we... Uh, I'm, how can I put it? This place is designed so that there is a dignity in our comprehension of the, the work of the artists who painted these works. I'm so glad that you pointed them out. I must point out, I've been to many great museums and galleries that remind me of this one, and many of them are in the United States. The reason why I say that American culture has got problems is it was the Americans that uh, blew it when Gorbachev said, uh, I think the time has come for Russia to be part of Europe. Of course, it's unthinkable that Russia is not part of Europe. I mean, without Russian culture, we don't have Europe. Not really. And I, I think one of the great reasons why I use the Edinburgh Festival, uh, I use my gallery as, as, as a, how can I say, an academy. Uh, I was inspired by Black Mountain College. And thankfully, it was America that decided to continue the work of the Bauhaus, which was essentially a European <coughs> manifestation of culture and linking the world of all the arts, including architecture, music, dance, performance art, everything, uh, so that we had the idea of a proper academy taking the language of all the arts seriously. Black Mountain College did that. And when it died, uh, the death, far too soon, I thought the time had come for Americans to come to Europe. And I lectured in about 50 American universities and uh, museums, galleries, and all over the place on the subject 
that uh, there would be a place for Americans to experience the real McCoy. Now, the real McCoy is not in the great collections that you have in Chicago or even Los Angeles, which is my idea of a hell on earth. Um, the real McCoy exists in Milan, for example, in that painting of paintings, The Last Supper, mm -hmm. uh, almost dissolving before your eyes in a, a, a condition where you can see that time has not been kind to it. But it also exists in the great frescoes of Piero della Francesca. And there you have to ask yourself the question, is art to continue to be about the ever-changing uh, concept of exhibitions uh, moving quite quickly from the, the museum space and then being replaced by other shows. It, it does seem to me that we need places where we feel, I mean, my favorite gallery in London is the John Soane mm -hmm. Museum. And I think the academy has got to ask a question, every academy, about what is the best condition that you have to be experiencing to really look at a painting. Um, I'm not at all happy when I hear that, uh, that was that an exhibition somewhere in, in America where there were rows of people, uh, three or four in, in a row, walking past the Mona Lisa. I mean, that's not the way I would want to experience the Mona Lisa. And I feel we've got to rethink the whole idea of what happens when, whether it's an academy or a museum like this one or a gallery, a city gallery, has the responsibility of showing an artwork so that there's time for you to be alone with it, in silence, contemplating it, trying to digest its truth. I mean, I've been this morning uh, in the world of an artist's studio, and I, I, I was so happy that I was there. I felt completely, how can I say, astounded about how, how much I was learning from the way the, the artist, who happened to be Stephen, had arranged his work. Uh, not, just, not just the paintings, but the whole machinery for making paintings, the, the layout of the brushes, the, um, the, the filing, the, the, the library, uh, God knows what huge um, effort to, to actually, and then, and then the unfinished paintings on easels, uh, where he was trying to deal with the problem of when is a painting complete? And I, th I thought, my God, why is it that the Edinburgh Festival is now approaching its 70th birthday and it's really run by the economic reality of what happens when it's dominated by the physical presence of 1,200 and some stand-up comics. I mean, good heavens. That has given me much food for thought. What kind of desperation has the human race revealed there? Um, in front of the paintings of Stephen, or any serious painter, I know that possibly there will be a moment when I'll be brought to tears. And possibly, I will witness the fact there's a very gentle uh, aspect of the sense of the ridiculous or uh, a sense of humor. The whole range of human emotions is built in to these images. And I think that one of our problems here is persuading our politicians to take places like this seriously. Uh, as I walk past <laughs> the extraordinary imposing uh, facade of this building, I thought how it is almost 
the climax of O'Connell Street. You know it's going to be there, thankfully, at the top. And it, it's everything about it, the exterior and the interior, the light coming in through the windows, uh, the, the light of day illuminating, giving an extra dimension to these paintings. I have uh, presented something like 3,000 exhibitions in my life. Can you imagine that? And I don't think I now feel that the, it was effective because I became, I became part of a kind of circus in which, uh, and now, I mean, I've, I've looked at the extraordinary, I've experienced the extraordinary world of a painter and I have been worried because it's a marvelous, extraordinary world about how you preserve it or keep it going uh, because it deserves it deserves something beyond simply showing it. I will bring something like 20 of my friends here and some important uh, art historians and critics. It's, it's my moral duty to do that. I've got no choice. I have to do it. But that, even that is not enough. And I believe that we have to ask questions of the academies, of the galleries, about all the places known as festival cities, about how we use, what is, what is the, the difference between entertainment and the sublime nature of a great experience, a great orchestra, a great work of theatre. What is the difference? It's a crucial difference which we need to somehow defend and hand over to succeeding generations. If we continue to give over uh, the whole idea of cultural activity to the world of entertainment, so that there's something as disgusting as the, the Turner Prize. I know you were involved in it. I mean, I can't imagine you didn't win. And that uh, Gilbert and George won that coveted award, so-called. I'm glad you didn't win, because it proved to me that uh, the whole thing's nonsense. Uh, I would think the museum today has a lot of responsibilities. It has, um, and this gallery is supported by, is, is actually funded by Dublin City Council. Uh, and um, which, you know, we're always looking for more money, but the money we have got. I think you have to have a balance between what we call what's the permanence in, in, in what you can mm. see in a gallery, and also I do think people like um, exchange of exhibitions. I do think people like to see something new coming through. It's almost like um, an opera or an orchestra, you know, that you, you, you come and see something. So, and um, I think the other thing is it's behoven on us to have uh, measurements that are not just simplex one, you know, we had X amount of visitors through the door. And that's the real challenge, and I don't have the answer to that, but what actually, when people come in, um, the belief that the culture, or that the, in this case, the culture being the art, actually has, um, if you want, want for, has, has had a, a very positive experience on the people that come in. And that sounds also woolly, but it is society, and society, the culture in society means that you don't have um, armed guards, for example, at the front door. You, you, people wander through freely. There is this wonderful culture of accessibility to what belongs to everybody. And the public museum, I think, has a duty to develop that culture of ownership and participation. But we also then are asked, you know, um, you know, what are we doing with the money and how we deliver on that. And it is always the question of finding other ways of determining how this culture is working as opposed to just visitor numbers. Um, and, but then again, I also think the other thing is the uh, being a platform and making visible 
what the artist does in his studio. We have Francis Bacon's studio here, yeah. and God knows, Stephen, I don't think he ever washed a brush in his life. So, but we have Francis Bacon's studio, which is the process of painting, and that was what we showed. You know, you go back into your studio, you're, you're away from everybody, you're no longer either famous or not famous, you have the challenge again to make that mark that Richard was saying, that you actually have to start all over again, no matter whether you were at auction or you got the best reviews, you don't know, you have to start all over again. And I think that is very real. But, um, and, but also making visible what people have been creating. And I think it's behoven in us in this city with our, with our communities, all our arts communities, that we do try and platform changing exhibitions. So I suppose it's our challenge then also to have an exhibitions, permanent collection, experiences, and not fall into the uh, area of entertainment. But a lot of museums have this huge pressure on them to bring in more people, just make it happen, have concerts, you know. So if there's anybody else has an observation on that, make. Well, that's very interesting. I'm, I'm just going to change the direction, if you don't mind, and maybe just uh, move on from that and take that on board. But uh, it's just a more uh, direct question addressed to Stephen in the, that we were talking earlier on come up about being on the periphery and maybe the opportunity that culture has uh, in today's world uh, and how the periphery can play, has the potential to play a central role. And uh, my question to Stephen is um, why he has chosen Ireland as the base to uh, operate from. <laughs> You know, uh, obviously the, the wonderful exhibition that we have here in the gallery uh, covers all of Europe, much of Europe, and places that are very important to you, like the Porto, the Sunday painting of the bridge there is very important that uh, your eye cast on uh, our own environment in Dublin in particular. Uh, but mm -hmm. so it's, a, it's, it's just a particular, it's a specific question as to why uh, with the uh, wealth of experience and the breadth of experience you have in different cultures within you, you chose, you finally chose Ireland as a place to, to base yourself. I, I think at a certain stage of my life, it's not unusual, when I was around 60, um, like most peripatetic people, you need your own language. I speak several foreign languages, but I don't speak them as well as the locals do. And I don't speak them as well as I speak English. I wanted to come back and live and work in a country where English was spoken. I mean, there are lots in the world, but there, are only, there were only two possibilities for me. It was either London or Ireland. And I don't say England or Ireland, I mean London or Ireland. London is, in a certain sense, my home city. It's where I was born. I spent a lot of time there. The other part of my culture I was brought up to constantly appreciate was Ireland. And my father wanted, to, wanted us to come back here. And, up with part of it. What's your favourite city? Mm -hmm. Rome. Rome. <laughs> now, it's, this has gone on quite a while. Uh, is there any other questions? Are there any other questions? Well, I think there is the question of education. You know, uh, Stephen is also a teacher, and he, he was extremely well taught by someone called Coldstream, uh, how, how to paint, <laughs> basics. Um, but he himself is a teacher, and I think one of the ways in which we can provide a future for places like this, or academies, is uh, to find the role of the artist, not just as a maker of art, but there's someone who can inspire through education. Watching an artist make a work of art, being anywhere near a studio, for example, can be uh, an experience where, where no doubt you're being educated. I was educated today. I was grateful because I saw things that I needed to know about, which I'd never experienced until I was seriously involved in conversation about everything in that uh, space. Um, it's the most remarkable space.
because I've never seen anything like it anywhere in the whole of Europe. And it makes me realize that he does indeed belong to Ireland. And um, it's a part of Ireland that really nobody knows about. I think it's, uh, it's a kind of nowhere's will space. Uh, you don't find it on any of the big tourist maps. It's free of tourism. And it's a special place because I know he loves it. He loves every tree, every aspect of um, the river, the great river that runs through uh, the landscape and, and through the small town. He, lo he loves the light. He loves the animals. He loves the texture, the stuff and substance of the exterior. But, but not the local planning commission. But not the local planning commission. I'm glad he's grounded here. Uh, I think some of the great Irish artists of the past had to be identified with the experience of living in Ireland. And what they did was they, through that experience, uh, give to the world a truth that could only come from Ireland. Uh, I mean, I, my whole effort is, is, is to help artists do that. I don't want artists to leave, for example, Scotland uh, and, and uh, live somewhere else. I want them to be in Scotland, but to believe that they're part of a world uh, where the language they're using is international and timeless. And the, that language has to be not just about those people who happen to be alive at the moment, but for those generations to come. Every time you paint a painting, you've got to think, how long is that painting going to be of use? Because it, it's really about truth, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I must quote Keats here. Yeah. He said, the only thing you need to know about anything to do with culture is that beauty is truth and truth is beauty. You've got it in this room, this is beautiful. It's inspiring and it's true. The architectural space created is true and beautiful. And that's what I found about every aspect, every doorway, every window, every object in that space was there for a very important and true reason. Now, that's why I was amazed. I was learning uh, a great deal, very, very fast. Uh, I was wondering why I could have been so ignorant about certain vital truths in the life of the artist uh, up, up till now, how dangerous that was uh, in my track record of putting on so many exhibitions. And I think that if I could give anyone I care about and respect uh, a gift, it would be the gift of being that close to the workspace of the artist. Thank you very much, Richard. I know it's now 25 past um, um, eight, uh, so you've been a great audience this evening. Um, I probably take out of this the culture of uh, participation, the culture of uh, learning, and you know the culture of creation um, are fundamentals for, for the arts, and they are things that every society, Ireland, European societies, have nurtured and really must continue to embrace and to nurture as, a, as, as I suppose, a core element of social life and civilization. So I'd like to thank Stephen McKenna and Richard DeMarco very much for coming. <laughs>